Charles Thornton and Richard Tomasetti, uh, the principals of Thornton Tomasetti in New York, one of the great uh, building engineering firms of our time with, uh, with so many projects on your, uh, on your portfolio. And they're here to get the Fosler Kahn Medal, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, congratulations. What, you have the benefit of, of the hindsight of all of these years and all of these projects that you've worked on. Uh, and we're just coming back from Shanghai where uh, there's just some amazing activity going on uh, and in Asia and there's so much tall building activity going on in the world today. What's your view on, on everything that's happening? Well, it's kind of, I find it fascinating when uh, the World Trade Center came down on 9-11, it was the death knell for tall buildings. Guess what's happened since 9-11? There are more tall buildings under construction all over the world than ever before. So obviously, people, people want to live in urban, they want to kind of live in, in, in tall buildings, and uh, I think it's great. I mean, it's great for, for us, we, you know. We like tall. <laughs> well, I think this philosophy of density is good okay, has been driving this. Uh, uh, there used to be, I think, somewhat of a negative uh, feeling about density. Uh, everyone likes these wide open uh, spaces. But I think we're going back to the, uh, uh, the older way of doing things where people want to be in a, an urban environment and, and then they want to escape to the, to the country. But they also, <laughs> they want to get out of their car. I mean, you heard the presentation a little while ago on the Absolute Tower, okay? The pe people, people in Mississauga Miss or whatever you call it, I know where it is, it's right near on Toronto, they, they, they're tired of driving. So, so why not take advantage of the fact that all this infrastructure is there in a lot of cities, you know, it's, the, the, the utilization of the sites is not very good, but the infrastructure is there. So why not urban infills? Why don't we do taller buildings, smaller buildings, you know, and, 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 and not get away from urban sprawl, which is what that and this is said. Uh, And this is supported by uh, the environmentalists and uh, all of the people studying green technology because you, you save on the f fuel, you have a much lower carbon content uh, and everything when people use uh, uh, mass transportation. Uh, there's been some interesting uh, uh, discussions lately on the developing countries such as uh, China uh, that they, they probably, it's impossible for them to develop like some of the Western com countries did with the amount of consumption that we have here. They have to put emphasis not on consumption, but on sharing. They have to have cities where things are shared, the transportation is shared, the walkways are shared, the buildings are, are, are shared, which is all about uh, high, high, high density. So I think, I think we're going in a direction where we're going to see more and more of it. And then when people want to be out in the country, they take that break and they go away for a weekend or go away for a week, not to the suburbs, but really to the country. Uh, you have the distinction in your career of helping lay the groundwork for uh, Chinese building codes, some of the more modern Chinese building codes, and the council uh, cited the Plaza 66 project as being the basis for that. What was that like and how much, uh, how much groundwork was laid there? Well, well, that was yeah, that was Richard. That was primarily a a, <laughs> um, a a structural issue where we were designing at that time the tallest all concrete building, and it was very slender. And the code, at the time, said the height over the uh, uh, the, the the height of the, the sway of the building couldn't be any more than the height divided by a thousand. Okay, now that's like you know. Uh, twice the normal thing, or one half the normal thing. It's usually uh, in the order of height divided by uh, uh, 500. So using wind tunnel tests, which we always do, and uh, the accelerations of the building, we were able to convince them to allow us to do a building that wasn't uh, that rigid, something in the order of height over uh, uh, 500, which actually saved about $5 million on, on the yeah, project. Yeah. But you could, you could extrapolate that experience to all the other things in, in, in the code also. It's really interesting. Uh, we arrived in Kuala Lumpur with the Cesa Pelli, the whole team, in 91. All right? And maybe it was because of the prime minister, maybe it was because of Petronas, the oil company. But they, they said, okay, do it to the highest standards of American design. Richard arrived with Cone, Pettis, and Fox on the tail of Bill Baker and SOM, and they did battle with the Chinese design institutes who didn't say, give us the best. We want, we want to take our code, which was written for 10-story buildings, and apply it to 60-story buildings, okay? And you, you and Bill Baker, I mean, really, he did it on the Jin Mao Tower. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, a, there was a battle, 
okay, to bring the Chinese design institutes to understand that, hey, we've been doing this a long, long time, and H over a thousand, there's going to be very little room to live on the floor. <laughs> the columns are going to be so big. And it, was, it took time. Dennis Poon and Richard and, and a lot of other people, uh, and Thornton Tomasetti, all went and took logic and experience and the state-of-the-art wind tunnel testing and acceleration perception. And I think it's, it's, it's worked. Oh, there's been major changes in their codes. I'm glad you brought up Caesar Pelly because one of the projects I wanted to talk about was the never built Miglin Beitler Tower in Chicago. How, how much of a precedent setting project was that Miglin Beitler Tower? It was a very precedent setting. Uh, the footprint of the building was 120 by 120. 2,000 feet tall. Do the math. We introduced the outrigger columns, the four columns, two on each face, eight total. Okay, and we actually were able to extend out onto the sidewalk and you could walk through the column. So it ended up not being 120, it was more like 150 to 160, okay? And we took, we, we, we understood that Chicago had the best dolomitic limestone aggregate of any place in the United States. And we went with Prairie and the other high strength concrete guys. We did some test caissons. We took the concrete strengths up to 18,000, 20,000. You realize when we got to Malaysia, there was no high strength concrete industry. There was no steel industry. Okay, there was no exterior wall industry. And our contract with C. Zappelli had technology transfer built into it. We were obligated to bring high strength concrete and steel and high, high performance curtain walls as part of our contract. And we did it. And that was the first application of that design, actually the first application of the Miglin Beitler design elements, right? Miglin Beitler was square. Petronas became round but it was the eight-sided star. And no, it's uh, Paul Beitler. <laughs> Paul Beitler's a really good guy. He said, I paid you all that money and we never built my building and then you took it all to Malaysia. <laughs> I said, yeah, Paul, thank you. <laughs> there was also a more subtle thing happening at that time in the industry. Engineers were realizing more and more about the damping properties of concrete. There was always a lot of discussion that uh, very, very tall buildings uh, may have to always be done in steel. But as we understood more and more how significant the damping differences were with steel and concrete, and that the concrete assisted more in reducing the accelerations and the perception of motion, okay, concrete started to become very, very popular for very, very tall buildings. See, when we got to Malaysia, the average office building, concrete office building, took 14 days per floor. Maybe it was a 12,000 square foot plate, maybe it was a 20,000 square foot plate. We did a floor every two days. How did we do that? With the, with the circular soft tube and the rather robust 70 foot by 70 foot core. And we knew that if we really focused on mass, density, weight, and damping. We could probably do the Petronas Towers with no TMDs, no tune mass dampers, and we don't have any except in the pinnacle at the top, okay? If, if we also knew that, that the China Steel and Nippon Steel were just waiting to do an all steel building because the World Trade Center was all steel, Empire State Building was all steel, everything was all steel, the Hancock Building, the, the uh, Sears Tower. So, you know, I always said, so, so these lunatics from New York and Chicago go to Malaysia and we're going to do a concrete building? <coughs> Who are these guys? <laughs> and there's no absolute rules. It's project by project, actually, because just a few years later, we did the next tallest building in the world, 101 Taipei, and that is essentially an all steel building with a tune mass damper on the top. Except the columns are boxes and they're filled with concrete. That's the one area there's a so, composite. You know, so if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, and some of those, I got, we have pictures. One of those box columns, there's, there's three, four people can stand inside of it <laughs> and, so, and it's filled with concrete. So we're getting that mass, we're getting that, that, that damping, which comes from the fact that if the concrete is getting tensed, then it's going to crack. And as it cracks, even though the hairline cracks, that's damping. That's when every, all things are rubbing against each other, that's dissipating energy. And so, but t the, the Taipei project was strong seismic typhoon and ended up needing a wonderful 
pendulum round damper at the top, which is a great attraction. I mean, they you can, the children come from schools and go up. Have you been in the building? I've heard of it. I've yeah. seen the photos of it. Yes. Yeah, you can go up and watch the TMD swing while you're having a drink. As you have alluded to in other conversations, you know, sometimes architects and engineers don't talk so well. Uh, but you've uh, partnered with Caesar Pelli, uh, Helmut Jan, Calatrava, Smith Gill. Um, how would you characterize those, uh, those working relationships? We listen, we understand what they're trying to attain, we help them attain their dream, and at the same time we attain our own dream through collaboration. Is it a matter, because you're the ones that really make those dreams come alive. Yeah. Uh, you know, they come up with the shape and the concept, and you're really the ones that come up with a way to do it, right? Here's the key, okay? On a five-story building, they don't need us. On a 200-story building, they can't stop without us. We like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it forces collaboration. It really forces collaboration. You, you can't, you can't, the architect can't start designing a tall building without getting structural engineering input, foundation input, and wind tunnel acceleration input. So we, we become more important, and I've always liked being important. <laughs> it helps with the fees. Absolutely. Yes, it does. Um, I've heard talk, uh, we heard talk in Shanghai, really for the first time, sustained and serious about a mile high building. And of course, that's been a goal ever since Frank Lloyd Wright put out his design for the Illinois. Are you surprised by some of what you see uh, as in terms of height aspirations now, or has it really been a logical extension of what's been going on so far? It's, it's a very difficult question because I think it depends, again, on that ratio of economic value to esteem value, right? And it seems esteem value has been uh, doing very, very, very well because these very, very high buildings, they, they put a place on the map. They totally contribute to the uh, uh, community as far as making it be uh, branded in, uh, on the globe. All right? and, and we're seeing more and more uh, of that, it seems, and it seems to be a value to that esteem, uh, uh, esteem value. So I, I, it doesn't surprise me, and I think you're going to see uh, see it uh, going on more and more. We're already at uh, what, you know, uh, uh, kilometer. kilometer, okay, with Kingdom Tower that Thornton Thomas said he is doing with uh, uh, Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill. Uh, so I think you will you will see this, and you probably will see a mile high building uh, at some time in the future. Congratulations on your on your lifetime award, uh, Charlie Thornton and Richard Tomasetti, and glad to see you in Chicago. Thanks very much. All right, Great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.